How many of you already have a butterfly? Guard or butterflies give me a guard. How many want them? <laughs> okay, we're all the same place. I've given this talk a few times, and I'm sure some of you uh, know more than I do on this subject. But um, we're going to talk about it again. And our new friend Lisa, who heard about the Taunton Cave, has a, a, a large yard that she wants to put a butterfly garden in. So we're going to talk about her yard and ask her questions because I'm going to pick your brains too to help her get her butterfly garden. Although I have to say what I did recommend to her because she said her area is as wide as from here to those light blue pots and almost, almost as wide. That's a big space. I said, these folks have a wonderful landscape department. <laughs> They'll come out and draw you a plan, especially if you tell them you want to phase it in. Because when you have that big a space, and I've run into this because I've had to redo a section of my yard this year. It just got tangled and overgrown and then all these uh, cherry laurels had popped up like out of there. So, so I have this big, vast area. I was like, oh, I can plant the next thing. I know it's pretty easy. So weeded it, got the mulch out. So I'd rather look at mulch. You don't want to ever leave dirt bare because it will grow and mulch away. But um, the first thing you do before you do your butterfly garden or any kind of garden is to get your soil checked. Um, I wasted a lot of money before I took the master garden Planting things and soils that were not suited for it. It was just, oh, this is good sun. It's got pretty good drainage, but I didn't even think to get the soil tested. It was one of those things that just never crossed my mind. Uh, at the extension office out on Paul Russell Road, and you can buy, you can pick up, they're free. The bags, they want you to put the soil in and the instruction sheet. Uh, and the address, and you just do your bags. If you have a garden that big, you probably want to get samples from each end. And for each sample, you get them within like 10, 12 feet to get it in a different spot. This, this one might have a little more calcium, and this one might have a little less potassium. But you mix it all together in a little bag. The kind of bags my granny used to freeze butter beans in and uh, the twist ties. You send it off and they will send you a report back within two weeks. They'll also send a copy to the extension office. And so somebody there will contact you to help you understand what your soil test means. I, uh, I hadn't looked at one in a few years, I confess. I hadn't had the soil test lately. I just keep putting more uh, compost on it and working it in. And now that I'm changing this time for me to get mine tested and follow my own advice. But I was looking at their report and they've changed it since the last time I got mine done. I said to the local horticulture agent, I said, you need to throw a class for how to read these things because I'm not sure most of the master gardeners would know how if they haven't had the soil checked in the last three years. It's very technical, which is great information if you know how to read it. I did. So that's why they sent a copy to the extension office as well as to you. Um, for three dollars, you get your pH test. For seven, you get that plus the micronutrient analysis and your, your big three: nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. NPK. Uh, our soil here tends to be very, very high in phosphorus the limestone formation, the karst formation. As a result, when we put fertilizer in the soil, it's high in uh, phosphorus, it runs off. And then you get algae bloom in the springs, and then fish die. The things that we laugh at the things the fish eat die, it just causes a mess. So you don't want to over fertilize. And unfortunately, when people are going for flower blooms, they like to buy that bloom buster fertilizer, which is very high in phosphorus. So we don't need more phosphorus generally, uh, but you will occasionally find a yard, especially one where they've scraped all the topsoil away, uh, new construction in the neighborhood, you may need a little, and on the south side, there's some really sandy places. So get your soil tested, and uh, somebody from the extension office will tell you what, if anything, you need. So that's basic number one. Uh, number two is, Figure out, oh, I see my assistant has joined us. 
and there are three cats that live here, and they're all very friendly to people. But the orange one was up in that tree chasing birds while ago. Roger, Roger, I'm not 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 Roger, don't say, I'm just going to plant this to get some butterflies, because you need to like it too. Butterflies are very um, much democratic in where they choose to eat nectar. They'll try about anything if it's cold. So figure out what you like, and then adapt that to what the butterflies are. Does anybody have a specific kind of butterfly you're trying to attract to your garden? Because while they're pretty uh, universal in what they'll eat in terms of nectar, when it comes time to lay the eggs and then the egg hatches, you have your caterpillar, which is your larva. Swallowtails? They're very particular about what they'll eat at that stage. So that's why they only lay their eggs on plants that will provide larvae. The four stages of a butterfly is right. Egg, the larva, the pupa, uh, the chrysalis. Some and they're here already. I've seen butterflies in my yard. We've had some spooky weather. Uh, one winter, got up to the 90s in late February. Had a late freeze. Here it is, April 8th, and it was 40 degrees. But as we were talking earlier, a couple of months ago, we should have been So, uh, Let's just enjoy it. It's been pleasant up here. It's a nice day. Uh, I pulled together some plants here to talk about um, the plants that will grow and attract butterflies. Because butterflies don't have great vision, but they can see color. And their favorite color is red. They like red, they like orange, they like bright colors. They'll come to white, uh, and other colors, but red is red and orange, the really bright ones, are the ones that attract the most. So the more butterflies you want, plant more of these bright colors. And don't polka dot them. Do them in mass. It looks more planned. It looks more natural. These are Pinterest. If you can only buy one plant for your butterfly garden, get a piece. Um, anybody has a different uh, perspective, thinks I have something wrong with me? No, there's more than one right way to do this. Share ideas. These are pink pentas. Uh, they are what's called a tender perennial here, meaning um, a good freeze will kill them if you don't protect them. I have some pentas in my yard. We haven't had a brutal winter in several years, uh, so I've had some that come back. They get about this tall and this wide, and if you get several of them together, they make a nice mass that attracts butterflies. You also, uh, borrowing from our design, you want to plant in odd number groupings. Uh, three, five, seven, nine. Uh, somebody asked me why. It looks better that way. There's less of a tendency to line them up like soldiers and balance on either side like a formal garden. Uh, so these are pentas, but they come in lots of other colors. They come in uh, red and white, different shades of pink. Here's a red one. And these look really great together when they're planted on masked up bunch. This is a salvia, one of the salvias, but they too come in lots of colors. Uh, this one is sort of a in white. I hadn't seen it before, so I grabbed it. But there's indigo spires, there's black and blue, there's lots of different colors of perennial salvia. And then you have your annual salvias. Uh, and they all attract butterflies. And they all look nice, kind of blowing in the breeze. And hummingbirds, too. Hummingbirds. That's true, they will attract hummers. Uh, where is. This is a plant that suffered from bad PR. Poor branding. For years it's been called quarter weed. And this is a blue quarter weed. And I took a picture of the tag so I could give you the right thing. I saw it had a new name. And it's 
now called Metal Leaf Velvet Berry. Doesn't that sound so much nicer than quarter weed? But it gets probably four to five feet tall. It has the flowers up here on the end. It sways in the breeze. And it gets about this big around. And it's called Nettle Leaf Velvet Berry. But I bet you can find it under quarter weed. So <laughs> uh, this is new with the name change. That one used to grow in the wild too. I yeah. And in some what areas, of flowers are, get? What, what color do the flowers get? This one is blue. There's a little bit where one is faded off on the top, sort of a purplish blue. But there's a coral pink one that they sell too, that I have in my yard. And it looks really nice. And it blooms in late summer. Uh, looks really good. And it uh, it is pretty much pest free. One to three feet tall and wide. Uh, pretty. Um, and I try to stick with perennials. There are a lot of annuals that will attract butterflies. But you have to replant them every year. And if you don't mind that, that's great. Uh, I would love to have the Disney World kind of sweeps of annuals. But no can do. But if you have perennials and small shrubs as your backbone, you can have, you know, five manuals and have them fill in and have them look nice. Some of them you need to deadhead. Most of them you need to deadhead, which is picking off the stem flowers so that more will bloom. But that's why I try to stick with perennials. Uh, monarchs. Everybody loves the monarchs and we have the big monarch festival down at uh, St. Mark's every year at the National Wildlife Refuge as they're coming through. They will they love butterfly milkweed, asclepias. They also like my butterfly bush. So this is the case where you need to make sure you have the right larval too. And I've got some handouts I'm going to give you that come from uh, the extension service that talk about larval food and nectar food. Just got to make sure, you, like getting your proteins in and your starches, you got to get them both. So, I will hand out this literature later, but uh, I will also warn you about butterfly milkweed, botanical name of Sclepias. There are some natives and some non-natives, and you're always better off going with native plants for butterflies because they're already acquainted, they know each other, and natives do better. Um, when you have a late freeze or an early freeze, if you planted natives, you don't have to scramble to cover them up because they may die back, but they're not going to die. They don't come back, so you don't really have to worry. But yeah, natives and butterflies are a good match. Uh, but when you plant butterfly milkweed, you may think you're planting it there, but it's going to decide where it wants to. I have planted it in a spot that I have always wanted the milkweed. Next thing I know, it's over here over there. It's coming up in front of my bottom step. There's a crack like that between the bottom step and the sidewalk. And here comes the butterfly milkweed. I just step around it. Uh, it's very pretty. <laughs> it's windblown. Oh, and the, the seeds are windblown and off they go. Carolyn, have you had the same experience with milkweed jumping? I only had milkweed one time and it just disappeared. So I so, yeah, I thought, what's wrong with my soil? This would be good for the milkweed. Nature has its own mind. So you go with it instead of fighting. You're a lot better. Here, this is verbena. Uh, most of us love verbena. I love red. Can you tell? I like red and pink. I like bright colors. But I have, I picked these up show how you can incorporate butterflies and still have some sort of sense of design. I have a, I live near Midtown and I have a block home built in 1960. And there is a raised bed out front of the bedroom part. It's blocked. It's up, it slopes like a yard, but it's up I'd say about this high where you start. And it's got a planting area about that wide in it and it's probably 40 feet long. I have tried all sorts of stuff in there. And what I'm going to try this year is this because they'll tumble over the front and 
when I bought the house, the former owners had cast iron going up in a sale using the front. I thought, what a wasted opportunity. Because this wall for something to cascade over. I couldn't get the cast iron out, but I knew somebody who could get it out and I got it done. So uh, I had day lilies in there one year. Well, but I think this will do okay because both of these are meant to tumble over. This is a, it smells really nice. This is White Knight. And there's another one I brought up, the, the more traditional. Ah. I usually plant this kind. It's Lopularia and it will tumble over too. I can smell this one as well yet, but that may be because it's chilly today. But having a little break from color with the white intermingling, I'm just going to do a row of the verbena and put the globularia in front. Uh, trees, also. That's how you get the butterflies. But 
they always have them out at court, but it looks ragged. Well, things like butterfly milk, you can get it to stay put in the back. So it's not front and center, if you're worried about how it looks. Although there are some people who love the ragged milk. They say, ah, oh, I've got butterflies, you can see. That. So it just varies from person to person. They need food, they need food nectar to draw them to the yard. They need larval food for the people to feed on when they emerge. And they need water. Life cycle isn't that long for most butterflies. But while they're here, it sure is nice to see them flip about your yard. I've got some handouts. But the first one I want to give you is not, it talks about butterflies, but other pollinators. When you plant for butterflies, you're attracting other pollinators too. I have a nest of their dollars up in the corner of the front porch, and I leave them alone. They don't attack, they're not like yellow jackets. And they pollinate too, but they never bother And that nest is good for a while. So think about that if, if it's not a day to do or you're a loved one. Kind of pollinated before you automatically knock it down. Think about it. This is something I want to encourage you to do. Bees, we have a lot of bees. This is lofty. Oh. This is my Vanna White. Oh. Roger, who runs the garden shop, what kind of books on butterfly gardening and material they have. Uh, as you can probably imagine, with everything so readily available on the internet, people don't stop this kind of material as they used to. But they do have a few things. Uh, they have a card here for handy reference Florida garden butterflies. And with most of them, there's also a little picture of the caterpillar that goes with it, which I find really handy. Um, because I have, as long as I've been gardening, I still have to, some of them I recognize, but some of them I have to look and say, okay, is that something I should get rid of? Is that a tomato hornworm or is that a butterfly to be? Where are those on? From the, the garden oh, okay. shop over there on the other side of the gift shop. They have butterfly stuff, they have birding stuff, they have tools, all sorts of stuff. They also have this, and which you need to pull out, and this is nice, because it's got the, it's got the caterpillars with it, and it's the southern, southern coastal plain. And so you can look quickly and see, okay, this is what the skipper's caterpillar looks like, I won't tell this is a real handy reference to just keep in your, your bag with your garden tools and while you're looking outside. And they have a number of these down there if you want to see them. Maybe it's just because I am a person of a certain generation that I like it. So there's Butterflies of Florida Field Guide. And especially if you have kids or grandkids, how to raise monarch butterflies. And this is step by step, um, and it talks about the whole process. When you teach them young, they won't be worried about the worms on their flowers and their butterfly garden. But yeah, and they sell the butterfly pages in there too. It's just a real big process to watch. Yeah, these are right here if anybody wants to buy them until we run out there and more down there. Another thing, people, some of the gift shops they sell is those butterfly houses, but a butterfly will not go in there. No, no. You have to get um, a chrysalis that's attached, which is the little cocoon, that is attached itself to the plant. And what you end up doing is breaking off that little twig and flipping it inside your 
your butterfly cage and uh, you just watch it emerge. Of course, you need to make sure once it has emerged and it's dry that you take the lid off and let it go. Because it won't live very long in there. It needs to get out and it's had, a, it's had its hot eggs long now. But make sure the kids see it and you can make a little bit of that. Uh, here's some literature on monarchs and uh, about the native milkweeds. Because some of the hybrid milkweeds that have been developed, they won't eat it. So it seems like they must not have what they think they need. Yeah. Oh, okay. so. I did some monarch, uh, oh, oh, that's another kind of lantana. I'm sorry, I didn't get to talking about that. Lantana is another one the butterflies love, and it makes a mounding, spreading shrub. Now, the old lantana is invasive. Orange and guns. They're trying to get it out of the state parks. Uh, it's considered an invasive exotic. But there are some hybrids that are a little better behaved. Uh, a standard is this new gold. Those of us uh, who are uh, like to plant it and some purpley looking red stuff, <laughs> close to garnet as you can get. Of course, those of us who also have a foot in the Gator Nation, we, we go for red, we go for orange and blue. In fact, my former next door neighbors went to U.S. I did my graduate work at FSU. But as a master gardener, I So, center line, blue, her side was orange, my side was yellow. On the other side of the driveway, and she had to pick on her We have to come out with us. We live all the Oh, I live off of Mississippi, about a mile from Tennessee, headed out to the Capitol Circle. Um, it's close to Midtown. It's really it was very close to the Grand Prairie. I work there. Right off the Circle. So it's nice there, too, in that because we're in town. It doesn't get as cold. When you get these temperatures when it's at the airport, when the weather says how cold it is or how cold it's going to get, that's at the airport. And it gets colder. But you can also get surprised. I'm usually 4 degrees, 4 to 5 degrees warmer, whatever the low is, uh, than what they had at the airport. It's because all the palm trees release the heat that's soaked up during the day. So, unless you have microclimates in your yard. If there's something that it may not be native, but it's really pretty and you want it. A friend of mine is dying for an olive tree. And you have to bring them in here. They can't take a cold. Well, she's trying. She's got it planted three feet from her house. And she's thinking that you know, the bee will protect it. And if you have to protect it from the house, they can go about that. You're really better off sticking with things that grow in your zone. But sometimes, moved up here from a house in South Florida where you lived for 30 years and you want to bring a piece of it. Uh, microclimates are spaces that get a little warmer or a little colder than the area of If you're on a slope, the, the cold settles to the bottom. So halfway up the slope, you may have a slightly warmer spot, especially if there are trees around to protect it. It may be cold and cold up here. So if there's a butterfly attractor that is, say, zone 9, because we're 8B, uh, climate change is not a joke. It really is getting warmer. Um, like these pintas are zone 9, but in the right place here, where it's a little warmer than the rest of the yard, that's when they'll overwinter.
Oh, yeah, the sun signs are even today. Our native azaleas are much more sun tolerant and they're more open, they have fragrance. They don't do that massive color like the... Uh, they're not a pretty plant, they grow. It's not pretty except when it's blooming. It's yeah, gorgeous. they're beautiful. But this talks about um, talks about the different butterflies and it tells you what the larval plants are. As I said, that's the only thing they're picky about is the larval plants. They'll eat nectar when they're going around laying eggs. They'll eat nectar anywhere, but they won't lay their eggs except the ones that the babies will have something to eat when they come out. And that's what I like about this one is it tells what kind of plant you need to plant it on. Uh, to plant to attract them. And then there's lots of pictures of them. Wildflowers can be gorgeous, they really can. But if you go for that formal manicured look, you probably won't stay away from wildflowers. And I have one more here. This is an updated version of one I just gave you. I had some left of the old version. But they expanded it to flowering plants and butterflies from the southeastern US. And there may be slightly new material in there. Did y'all want one a piece or y'all just need one? Conserving. We all yeah. believe in that. So those of you who have butterfly gardens, we're gonna help Lisa figure out how to get a butterfly garden out of her stretch. What would y'all recommend? Get her saddler and place some leave them in the pot and put them in the little saddler and them stay there a few days to see they get the right sunlight or what. what see how they like it there? Yeah. yeah that's a good idea. Pinches are a good place to start, as I said. Butterflies love, love the pinches. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about something called bidens, also called Spanish needles. They have some yellow gold bidens over there that appear to be fairly well behaved. Um, I have never bought Bidens, but I've spent hours pulling the wild white flowers, Spanish needles. And if you, when they set those little needle-like seeds, you're gonna have them next year. They're somewhat in case. But the butterflies love them. I, I didn't plant any. I have pulled a lot of them out, but if I get busy and can't get all of them out, I, Basic, doesn't that mean that like it's the weed instead of like grass? Well, the only problem with invasives, um, you know, things that are aggressive that spread may not be invasive, but invasives take over and smother out. Oh, okay. More desirable plants. Sometimes. That's the birds can spread invasive. to the seeds. Okay. Invasive is a little more pejorative than yeah. aggressive. Okay. Of course, when you see ones that are labeled vigorous grower, that's code. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, but you know, if you if you have a way to keep these vigorous growers in check, they can be great additions. Uh, mint. Um, I was just gonna ask you about putting herbs mint on their plants. That's a great thing to do. Um, I'm big into mixing. that was 
grown commercially was irrigated with some food and water or something. And you see these stories all the time. But it's just nice to grow a little bit of what you eat and still have a pretty uh, yard. And herbs fit into that. And there are certain herbs that um, I have never seen butterflies on the mint. But if I walk past the mint and I brush up against it, it smells nice while I'm out in the yard. So that's for me. And the butterflies don't seem to be offended by it, so that's fine. But yeah, you can mix in your herbs. Now there are some herbs that bloom. I have some African blue basil, which is perennial in my yard where I've got it planted. It likes it more. And it has beautiful purple spikes. The leaves are much coarser than culinary basil. You can use them in a pinch. It still tastes like basil, but it's not as pure a flavor. But they're just really nice in the yard. And the bees and the butterflies seem to love them. So that's one that does attract most of my bees. Carolyn, do you know of any other herbs that butterflies? Oh, rosemary. Um, we especially need dill in the yard. Is that dill? Oh, yeah, dill yeah. up. But that's what yeah, dill. Um, definitely, the swallowtails love it. Yeah. The dill burns out making the song. That's the problem. With dill. Uh -huh. Mulch is important because it keeps the soil yeah. cool and it holds the moisture. Uh, it also gives butterflies a place to hide. Did I did mention rosemary, but I didn't finish my thought. Um, it, it has lovely purple flowers, purple blue flowers, and I've seen butterflies on rosemary. I, I had a big prostrate rosemary at the far end of that raised wall bed I was talking about. I planted it about that tall. Well, and it was starting to trail already. It lasted almost 10 years. It was, my neighbor called it my rosemary on steroids. But because it was at the corner of the house, it got the burn off. Because I don't have gutters on that end. So it had plenty of water, but it also had great drainage because the thing was up like that high by the year because of the slope in the yard. People think rosemary needs okay. dry conditions. No, it needs a lot of water. It just needs great drainage. And anytime you're growing herbs, though, uh, you don't need really rich soil. In fact, herbs do better than average soil. To get that intensity of flavor from the leaves, they need to be a little bit stressed because the soil's not great. So save that enhanced potting mix or garden soil. The milk will grow it. Put it down and forget about it. Don't use that for herbs because you won't 
Just regular old garden soil. Um, that's fine. Just don't get the stuff full of fertilizer. I wouldn't feed my herbs. Do you feed yours? That good soil. I mean, the soil is tight. But yeah, anything is going to have an Partially by it. tired and died because it's this is extreme for some plants. We have terribly hot summers and very humid and it's tough to stay healthy, especially if you're prone to fungal disease. That's the biggest problem. We have a lot of things going grow down here because of the humidity. But it's not that heat is the problem. They can take in the grass in the summer and it gets pretty hot there. But they can't take it here. I'm not even a gardener yet, but you learn so much. I've been a gardener. I grew up in a family of gardeners. My city grandparents had flower beds and strawberry patches. They were handmade. My country grandparents had a big vegetable garden uh, and chickens. And so it was the best of both. And so I learned a lot about both of them. I learned I've been doing a lot of things wrong when I took the master garden class. It's a move, and every region is different. I grew up growing um, a lot of these things that attract butterflies in the summer. Well, they won't grow here in the summer, it's too hot. Uh, you plant your broccoli and your spinach in the fall. And I have to cover them if there's a hard freeze, but they won't live here in the summer. So, gardening here is unlike anywhere else. But that's also good. I've never lived anywhere else that I could have citrus trees and palm trees in the same time. And I do. You just got to get the right cultivar. So, and these trees also attract butterflies, especially when they're blooming. It's really cool. Is anybody else? I know we've just sort of been all over the place, but does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I was wondering. Um, these, this is also verbena, uh, same as this, okay. um, these are super bells, I think. Uh, I just like the color combination, and color is something else that's deeply personal. When I was growing up, you didn't match stripes, you wore stripes and flags. I see it all the time now, it's high fashion. You didn't mix orange and red. And now, somebody said, why do we have these rules? And I love our engineering together. I think it looks great. Um, you throw pink in there, I'm not so crazy about it anymore. I would put yellow. But a lot of it has to do with the tones, the shades of pink and red and orange. But now this gold, but this is a different land here. This is the Chapel Hill cultivar. And I think it looks pretty nice here. A little less red into that gold. So play with colors you like. Because as long as it's colorful, the butterflies are going to like it. Just remember, it's not just for the butterflies. You need to look at it, too. And you got to look at it when the butterflies are the Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. extra flyers for friends I have been to and uh, also seriously they, they do have a master gardener class every year. Um, How long does it take to do uh, about, they've a got it, about a whole year? They've got it much easier now. When I took it it was every Thursday for three months from nine to one and then you had to work in the demonstration garden. 
now they do the class once a month on Thursday morning, and the work day is once a month on Monday morning. So people who work full time can do it. I had to change my schedule to a schedule that worked to be able to take it when I took it. It works a lot better to get people who have obligations during the day. Jefferson County, they once did it at night. I don't know if they still do that or not. Um, it's not that and that's up to the individual sell extension up. agent who might want to teach it. Um, I know for years here they didn't teach it at night. They, and they didn't teach it on the weekends. They never have here. Um, but the point of training master gardeners, besides to share the knowledge, is to make them available to help residents with their questions, to be assistants to the horticulture agent. Not just to educate them, but to help them turn around and give it back to the community. That's why you uh, have to work a certain number of hours to keep your certification up. You have to work a certain number of hours in the next partner office. Helping people who come in with questions, answering the phone calls, calls. And it's a lot of fun because every time I work the office, I learn something. Because I'll get a call of like, whoa, I don't know. Let me look that up and get back to you. You don't have to know everything, you just have to know where to look it up. And the UF database is the things that are in there. Um, they have a very extensive horticulture program. But yeah, I learned a lot. So you might want to see about that they're in the middle of a class that started in February, January. They'll start another one if you want to inquire and get on the wait list. So um, I saved a whole lot of money after taking it, just because I was buying plants that wouldn't be well there. And when you go to these big box stores and they have these great deals, plants, treat them as annuals because they may not live. These, these stores get things in for everywhere, not just, they're not targeted to our area. And some people just want one season and that's fine. Also have a hard time sometimes finding somebody who can answer a question at those places. But at the locally owned establishments, they will tell you this is iffy in our area, but it's beautiful. You don't have to protect it or bring it in. But they won't sell you something that's going to die. They're not going to sell you a white 